All right. <laughs> Um, hello, everybody. Welcome to my last episode of Ask You and the Groomer. Except today, I'm not going to be the one answering the questions. I'm going to be the one asking the questions. Um, I'm going to be at interviewing my friend Barbara. Barbara is the owner of this, this business here. And I call it a business because it actually runs even if she's not here to run it every day. That's what I, view, I believe is a grooming business. A lot of businesses that I've been to, and I, even my business, when I had a quote-unquote grooming shop, it wasn't a business. I, if I didn't show up, doors were closed. <laughs> so um, what I wanted to do is, I'm getting lost. Okay, so I met Barbara 12 years ago, and I was desperately looking for a way to uh, learn how to groom dogs, because there's really not a reputable grooming school or anything like that here in Georgia, at least not at the time, 12 years ago. So I found Barbara's ad on some random <laughs> grooming website. I don't even know if it exists anymore. Um, and the thing is, when I met Barbara, she was the only groomer that actually had a plan. When I first went and met her, she was like, okay, we have some days we have lots of Shizu, some days we have lots of Westies, Westie day, Yorkie day. And on those days, after you're done washing all the dogs and having them all done prepped, um, I'll go ahead and teach you. Uh, we'll, we'll concentrate on one breed per day. And I was like, that's so amazing. You actually have a plan. When I met her, she was the head groomer at Sugar Hill Animal Hospital. And Dr. Hamrika, at that time, he told me that if I learned to groom half as well as Barbara, I would be one of the best groomers here in Georgia. And he was right. She still groomed circles around me. The student has not surpassed <laughs> the master. However, um, I don't need to because I'm done. <laughs> no, I'm <scared. laughs> Anyways, um, what I'm here to do is I'm going to just Go ahead and get my glasses on so I can read my show notes here. Um, I want to find out exactly how she created this business, how to maintain a successful business, um, all the ins and outs. And I wanted to just share this one quote before I, before I turn the camera and introduce you to my friend Barbara. I got this off of their website. I thought it was amazing. Swanky Paws was founded in 2012 with a dream, experience, a lot of hard work, and not much else. Swanky Paws knew they could provide a different kind of service that met their clients' high standards and set out to do it in, in a, and set out to do it. In a relatively short amount of time, Swanky Paws has become the talk of the town and the go-to destination for fabulous pets all over Metro Atlanta. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce my friend Barbara. Hello. Oh, hold on one second. There we go. Oh, all right. <laughs> I turned all it right. back to me because <laughs> I'm the star. You're very special. <laughs> okay. Now, Barbara. I'm convinced that the reason why I, f I failed my business when I started Horrific Spa down in Buckhead is because I couldn't make the shift from worker bee to queen bee. I was wanting to make friends with my employees. I was wanting to be just nice to everybody, and I, I had a hard time running a business. I just wanted to work, show up and work, and I could, but that means that nobody's actually being the captain of the ship. <laughs> You know, yeah. and so my business went under. And what I wanted to ask you, because I feel like before anybody starts the business, even considers opening up a business, so they don't go down the road that I went down and go in debt, severe debt like I did, 50 grand in debt. Um, that took forever to pay off, <laughs> crawl out of. But um, I don't want anybody else to go through that. So what I wanted to start off with is mindset. Do you think that that's important? Like having the right mindset to start a business also, because you weren't, when I met you, you were the head groomer there, but you were an employee pretty much. So was there a certain moment that you can remember? Like, is there a certain point where you, like something happened or something made that switch for you? Like where you switched your mind from an employee to an entrepreneur? So there were actually, there's a couple like pivotal moments. Um, I, when, when you and I met, I was working at, at Sugar Hill and I was working, you know, for, Hamrika and, and doing a lot of good stuff and, and I really I enjoyed my time there and I um, had another groomer that was working with me and she they they wanted to separate from her and at the time she, I wanted to help her get a new job and we went around to other local grooming shops and we met um, this kid at this groom shop and he was literally he was 19 years old and he had just opened his grooming salon and it was him and his sister and his sister was the groomer and he was the salesman in the bather and his sister was probably 20. Oh wow. And we 
myself and this other groomer, we looked at each other and we're like, we've been doing this for 20 years <laughs> yeah. and this kid has opened this business and here we are working for other people. And, and that was kind of the moment when it was like, okay, we know what we're doing. We need to go do this. And she actually ended up becoming my business partner, um, which I'm, we no longer are together as partners anymore, but um, we were for a long time. And, and we experienced a lot of the same things you did of, of being the workers, right? Because we were always the workers. So we yes. worked and worked and worked. And we, we wanted our employees to work with the same dedication and passion that we did. Yes. And we got very frustrated and angry when they did it. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, finally somebody looked at me and they were like, nobody's ever going to love your business like you do. Nobody's ever going to love your child like you do. Yeah, it's unfair to ask them to. Yeah, you, and you don't want them to. You don't want the babysitter to love your kid. <laughs> like you do. Yeah. You, you just want them to take care of your kid the way you need them to. And yeah. that is really, that was kind of like the, the shift for me. And um, since... Since my partner left, we I've had a, like a tremendous number of changes, and, and one of the changes has been me literally stepping back and taking mm. my hands off of a lot of things. Most people don't know how hard that is. It is extremely hard to give up control. Yeah. Um, and to be able to say, you know what? Uh, first of all, one, I was wrong, right? Okay, the way we were doing it wasn't working clearly, yeah. and we need to make some changes. I was wrong. Um, giving control to other people and saying I'm you know like I trust my team and that's huge is hiring yeah. people who are people like us doing things the way we do them that's that's really important right getting getting your team put together with good people um, and then when you do being able to say okay I hired you because I think you're good at what you do mm -hmm. now I'm gonna let you be good at what you do and I'm gonna take my hands off you know I I mean, so the the fact that you use the word control, it never hit me until just this moment. Listening to you, that's what I was doing. I was being a control freak. I remember one time um, at Sugar Loaf, uh, I mean Sugar Hill Animal Hospital, I was doing the kennel text jobs. Even I was cleaning the cages. I remember. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I remember you were you told me you stopped me and you said, Hey June, remember, you know that good feeling you get when you work really hard, you do a good job. I said, Yeah. You gonna other people might like that too. <laughs> I was like, oh, shoot. And you're like, maybe give other people a chance to work hard and feel good, too. You know? Right. Like, oh, that was control. I didn't realize. But that's, I'm so glad you used that word control because that's what it is. It's being a control freak. Well, and it's back to that perfectionism that we were talking about earlier. You know, it's like when, when you want everything to be perfect and my idea of what is perfect is the thing that I'm trying to, to manage and make everybody fit my idea of what is perfect, but they might not have the same idea of as me of what is perfect, right? Yeah. So, and granted, yes, it's my business, so it needs to be my rules, but it's really my policies and procedures, not, and, and as long as you get to an end product that the, the client is happy, the pet is happy, the team is happy, and everybody's safe, and everybody's comfortable with what's going on, that's the goal, right? The yeah. end product is a happy client. The end, the end goal is yes. a happy client. And if you're making a product, your groom is your product that that makes your clients happy and come back. Yeah. Yeah. Then, then you've you've achieved your goal. So it doesn't matter if your teddy bear head is shaped exactly like my teddy bear head. What mm. matters is that your teddy bear head was achieved with a dog that is comfortable and feels safe and is happy and given to a client who is happy with the price and happy with the product that they've gotten. And that that's 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 so hard to let go of. Yeah. You know, and just say it's okay. You you can do this. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of us groomers um suffer from perfectionism. Oh yeah. Because I I've had so many of my clients even tell me like, "Hey June, um all that stuff you're working on right now, no one care. sees that but you." Yeah. <laughs> They're like, "We don't even care." Yeah. And I'm sitting there sweating over it. Yeah. So I'm glad you mentioned policies and procedures because that's where I wanted to go next because um, once I decided that I wanted to have a business, um, I realized I need to write a business plan. My business plan that I turned in to the property managers, I can't even believe that they accepted it. It was a fairy tale. <laughs> I wrote a fairy tale. <laughs> it was bullshit. Um, how important is it to have a solid business plan and how does, how does a groomer even decide 
okay, this is gonna be my business model, this is how I'm gonna do it. Like, how does, how do they even, where do they start? Like, they have a blank sheet of paper in front of them, they have to write a business plan. What, what, like, how did you start? So, I started, I started like seven times. I started the <laughs> wrong way. I tried to make a business plan based on like internet templates for businesses like drugstores or uh, I don't know, childcare facilities, a restaurant. Uh -huh. None of those business plans have anything to do with working with live animals, uh -huh. right? You can't account for those things. And so what I basically had to do was kind of take that outline and just say, okay, what, what do I want? And I think more important than defining the business plan was recognizing one that it has to change and evolve, right? Because we tried to stick to it. But having a a guideline more than a plan, uh -huh. if that makes sense, yeah. um, we kind of devised like what what do we want to do? What do we want to sell? And I think that's where a lot of groomers get lost. Is like I just want to groom dogs. Yeah, we're selling trust. Yeah, you can't just groom dogs. Yeah, you, you can't just groom dogs. You have to be a salesperson, and you you have to. Deal, oh, I groom because I like dogs better than people. Okay, well, dogs don't pay because they don't have any money. Yeah. So you've got to get along with those people and you've got to find a way to communicate with them. Yeah. And um, it, it's really, really important. So if you can't get there, if you can't get to that place of understanding that you are in the business of sales, yes, you're not going to be successful in any business because every business, like by definition, is about making money, and you're not going to make money if you can't deal with people. So that's like that's like number one. Like yeah. you have to define what is your business. Like what are you trying to? What goal are you trying to achieve? Um, I, you'll see groomers that are like doing, you know, oh, I'm I'm going to do only seven strips and then but I also want to do beautiful scissoring but my clientele really just wants me to do summer cuts and but I want to do color and create mm. like okay well no that was a lot of word salad you know like yeah you've got to figure out who you are doing what for yeah who is your client like yeah. who is your customer who is your customer and what do they want and is that what you want to do and if that's not what you want to do then this you don't have the right location or the right clientele or or the right business model. So yeah. and if you've only ever worked at turn and burn shops where all they do is is fast bass with the dawn and and seven strips, then that's what you know and that's what you think is right. And if you've only ever worked at the poodle parfait and where yeah. everything is perfect and immaculate, then that's what you know and that's what you think is right. But that might not be right for you and that might not, you know, you might not want to take your, yeah, your buckhead prices and, and go out to winder. You might not get the same reaction. Yeah. And Location every, is important. It is. It's huge. And, and are you opening up next to another grooming salon? Are you doing that so that you can get their clientele? Or are you doing that because there's so much clientele in that area that it's saturated? Mm -hmm. You know, like why are, what is your motivation? Because we, we love to say there's enough dogs for everybody and there are, but are you being crappy to that person who has a business model that you don't agree with mm -hmm. because you just want to be better than them? Or are you trying to use your rising tide that floats all boats, right? Are you saying, okay, well, let's, let's bring more attention to grooming. You are so busy that you can't accommodate mm -hmm. all the clients in this area. Cool. We're coming. We're here to help. Right, yeah. we're gonna help you accommodate clients, and the ones that we that are our overflow will send to you, and you send our your overflow to us, and it's gonna be awesome. Yeah. That, that are we helping each other? Or are we exactly? Yeah, we, we compete, but do we compete to to hurt each other, or do we compete to help each other? Help each other grow. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So so that define that define who you are and what you want. That is the biggest, more than a, a business plan like the bank wants. And if you want a loan from a bank, yes, you have to have a bank style business plan. Mm -hmm. But if you want to be successful in your business, you need to have a business plan that fits your business. Uh -huh. Like who you real. are, yeah. what you want to offer. Yeah. Who, yeah, who your customer is. Absolutely. Yeah, and don't worry about the shop down the street. No. Unless you're trying to help them. Like, you know, it's like that saying uh -huh. about don't look in your neighbor's bowl unless you're making sure they have enough. Oh, I love that. You know, like that's the only time you should look at, at somebody else's stuff. What they're doing is, if, are you okay? Do you need my help? With the intention to help. Yeah. I, I remember Seth Godin saying something that really hit me. He's saying that when you compete with somebody on price and you try to lower your price to beat theirs, 
it's a race to the bottom. Yeah. And the worst thing that can happen on a race to the bottom is you win. Right. I was like, oh my God, he put that perfectly. We don't want to be the low price leader. Who wants to be the low price leader? Yeah. No. Yeah. If we all um, help each other and, and respect our prices and then we can all grow like, yeah. And you might, you might be like, I don't, I don't want to do that hand scissoring. I don't want to do that, that high quality. I just want to do 15, seven strips all day long and make that money. That's fine. Yeah. If that's what you want and that's what your clients want. There is no shame in that game. Do it, yeah. but define it and know that that's what you want. You know, yeah. if, if you want to spend all day grooming one dog and charge $500, do that. Yeah. Then if that makes you happy. Yeah. Right? If that's what works for you and if you can find the clientele that are willing to pay you and if you have the skill that justifies that, great. Yeah. I don't. I'm personally, I'm not happy that I went out of business. Um, it sucked. <laughs> but I'm kind of happy that it didn't work out because I realize now, had that shop worked out and if I had a staff there right now and it was busy, I would be miserable. It's not me. Yeah. I realize, like, and you are so right. We have to figure out who we are and what we want. That's more important than the business plan that the bank's gonna take. Absolutely. I mean, we didn't. We didn't get a loan. We actually got some little credit cards. Like, I think. I think we each had. I don't know, four or five thousand dollars on a uh -huh. credit card, and I had like four thousand dollars on a Home Depot card, uh -huh. and that's how we started Swanky Paws. Wow. Yeah. It was like. Okay, let's go. And we did, you know, we did a lot of the work ourselves and that kind of stuff. But but that was how we didn't start with a huge amount of debt. You know, if, if you start with a huge amount of debt, like your your first however long you're working is to pay off that debt. Mm -hmm. And then I do want to say one of the best pieces of advice that we got was from um, Million Dollar Dog. Uh, yes. She's awesome. And yeah. she, uh, she said, pay yourself first. Mm-hmm. She said, I don't care if you only pay yourself a little bit, pay yourself first. And when once we started doing that, it was like, okay, yeah, there is money. There's money to pay us. Okay, well, you know, this week is only $100. That's what we're getting paid, but that's what we... And, and make no mistake, we got paid $100 for a long time. Uh-huh. You know, we had to suck it up yeah. for a long time. But then, then no, I don't. Now I make more than $100. <laughs> Yeah. You know, I'm not rich. But you have to be okay with that in the beginning. Yeah. yeah, I did a lot of the grunt work myself too, building out that place. Yeah. That's another thing. Did you uh, negotiate at all the lease? Yes. I, I didn't know you could. I took the first offer they gave me and I, I was happy. Um, and I had no idea that I could have actually pushed back. I could have asked for quote unquote build out money. Yeah. I had no idea what that meant. And like, did you, did yeah. you get any? Yeah, we got build out um, on the first location and on the second location. Um, and then the other thing I think that that was the most valuable thing that I negotiated was in the first one, we weren't responsible for any of the HVAC. Okay. And in this location, we have a thousand dollar cap on our HVAC payments every year. So a thousand dollars a year, if the AC breaks, we pay a thousand dollars towards fixing it and the uh, landlord pays for the rest. I hope people are writing this down Yeah. because the nail salon next to me and Buckhead, they didn't do that and their HVAC went down and they had to pay, I think, $30,000 per unit and they had two units. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that'll put you out of business. Yeah. Right? There's no way. I, if, if somebody came to me right now and was like, you have a $30,000 bill and you have to pay it today or you can't operate, I would be like, okay, well. I mean, you can operate please. with fans, I guess. You know, like, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what the hell's going to happen because I don't have $30,000 and, yeah. and I'm, it I don't. It would literally be a sweatshop. Yeah. It would suck. <laughs> So, yeah. but I mean, you know, and obviously we can get loans and we can do that kind of thing. But like, I don't, I don't, most small businesses, I don't think have $30,000 in, in, uh, yeah. operating capital. That's like that, this liquid that they can just get their hands on. Yeah. Right not now. a grooming business, not any grooming business that I know. Right. Unless so, they have like an investor. Right. So, I mean, and, and we do have savings, right? We've got our little, our little months, two months worth of, uh, operating expenses set yes. aside. But if I take if I take all of my two months worth of operating expenses and then I have, yeah. you know, my AC really did break. And then now what happens is I got to pay the light bill and I got to pay the people. Yeah. So, you know, you, you, it, it, there are a lot of things. Rent negotiation is huge and, and you'll go to lease a place and we've had multiple leasing agents say, well, you know, it's the, it's, it's a landlord's market right now. So I'm sorry, but you don't have much negotiation room. That's bullshit. You do. Uh -huh. You 100% do have negotiation room because walk away. Don't be afraid to walk away. Mm -hmm. Remember that because if it's the perfect place, 
then it yeah. will be perfect. Right? Yeah. If it's the perfect location, but the landlord is a turd, then it is not the perfect place. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. I think the book was called Never Split the Difference. Um, but he was saying, he was an FBI negotiator, but he was saying, like, the walk away only works if you really walk away. Yeah, you have to you walk away. You can't yeah, You've got to be okay with it. You've yeah. got to be okay with losing that spot. Yeah. And, and that's, and that's you know, you've got to be okay with wrong, being wrong. You've got to be okay with, with realizing that, okay, this, this venture failed. It didn't fail. Your Buckhead shop didn't really fail because you learned so much from that and you were able to take all of that shit that you learned and put it into your new June the Groomer and put it into your, you know, your house call, put it into your education for other groomers. I mean, you, you learned so much that all of that shit was very valuable. It might have cost a little more than you, you would have wanted to pay for it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But it's not, when you, when you gain from your lesson, then it's not really a failure. You know, yeah. and you have to be okay with making mistakes and doing business ventures that don't succeed the way you intended them to. I think one of the biggest things that helped me after losing that shop, I wanted to, I wanted to like just disappear. I was like, never go on Facebook again. Like I'm gonna, you know, like I was so embarrassed. But then once I got over the fear of embarrassment, and I just like, hey, I failed. I, 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 I suck. You know, like. I, I made a lot of mistakes. I was wrong. That was so hard for me. So yeah. I was wrong. It is hard. Um, once I did that though, the value in it, uh, just openly sharing all the things I did wrong and all the mistakes I made, it was so helpful for everyone else. Yeah. They, they didn't have to make those mistakes. And I tell, I, I have told a million people and I will tell all of them, if they want to start a business and they have questions, fucking email me. I am happy to tell you, like, don't do it this way because this way sucks. And the yeah. reason I know this way sucks is because we tried it that way and it sucked, yes. you know, like, and, and I am happy to share my successes and my failures. Like I will tell you straight up, I do not mind. I fucked yeah. up a lot of things. And one of the things that I fucked up was like, we had a solid partnership and I did not recognize, like we talk about playing to your strengths. We talk about playing to your strengths in the bathing room, right? Mm -hmm. if one bather is really fast at, at drying but, and another bather is not, well, let's let's get the one that's really fast at drying to do the drying, mm. right? And we had our partnership set up where, where I was doing certain jobs and my business partner was doing certain jobs. And in my, I thought that we were both playing to our strengths. Mm. But I, when, one place that I failed was I did not realize that she was struggling. Mm. And because I was unaware or unwilling to see you know, because yeah. that is my failing, right? I'm, I'm just, I'm doing my thing. I'm looking yeah. at what I'm looking at and I wasn't paying attention to see that she was struggling and she really needed help until it was too late. You know, and th until we got to a place where she was like, you know, I, this is, I'm not happy. Yeah. Um, and maybe if I had seen that sooner and been able to take on some of those responsibilities sooner or change some of the responsibilities or whatever. Yeah. But, um, but it, I didn't, right? So now yeah. I have to recognize, okay, so I, I definitely fucked that up. And that's why now I'm, I'm all about like checking in. Like, are you good? Are you, yeah. can you handle the load that you've got? What I, what I feel like you're saying is that in order to run a successful business, you have to play coach. You have to put the people in the best positions that where they'll be the strongest so you can have a winning team. Yeah. Like, I think that's why Michael Jordan never became a coach. Even though you're a star at playing basketball, doesn't mean you're a good coach. Yeah. And I think, and, and you'll notice, I think in basketball is a good, it's a good analogy because most of the really good coaches, they weren't, yeah. <laughs> stars, right? That's true. They can't, they can't do a freaking dunking. Yeah. So they can't do sports balling. Yes. I'm, not, I'm not very sportsy, but, um, but yeah, like to be a good coach, you don't have to be an excellent athlete. You just have to be a good communicator. And I failed and failed and failed and failed at that. I had so many people quit. You are a nightmare to work for. You are so hard to work for. You, uh, you know, you just push and push and push and you just are so demanding. Uh -huh. And it was like, okay. That would probably happen if Michael Jordan became a coach. Right. Nobody would want to play for him probably. Right? Cause that he would want everybody to play the way he did. Yes. Right? Yes. I want everybody to be the groomer that I was. I yeah. want you to be able to groom the same, you know, you see all, all, always every freaking groomers fight club thread says there's no way you can do 17 grooms in a day and have any kind of good quality. I've seen really? you do it. Bullshit. Yes, yeah. I can. And my quality was good. Yeah. 
that's not sustainable. I can't do that forever. I can't do that indefinitely. I can't do that without a really good bather, uh-huh. right? <laughs> Doing a lot of prep work. Yeah. But um, but it is. It is possible. And uh, But what I was trying to do was get everybody else to be like that. Mm. And that's not realistic. And that's... Um, it's not sustainable and it's, it's hard and people don't like to be told that they're not as good as you are Mm. and they don't like to like, even if you're not saying it out loud when you're, when you're pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing and not trying to get them to, to grow and show you what their own strength is. Yeah. Right. Like I wasn't doing creative color on all those dogs and I wasn't doing seven strips nose to toes. Like, you know, I was doing good grooms, but I've got a groomer who is, she's great at color and she likes doing it. Mm-hmm. So, so let's push her in that direction, right? Let's, yeah. let's, let's help her to achieve that. We've got a groomer that likes doing the Asian stuff. Okay. Yeah. Do it. I'm let's so glad. I'm so it. glad we're going into getting into this because that's what I wanted to ask next is because in order to have a business that runs on its own, you obviously have to have groomers staffed in, that's, I think, one of the biggest problems. I, any grooming page you go on, the, one of the biggest complaints of every shop owner is the difficulty in finding, finding and, and keeping. keeping. Yes, because you can find, you can get lucky and find a good groomer, but they're probably not going to stick around, and they're probably going to take your clients with them. <laughs> you know, and uh, yeah, it's like even me, I feel so bad. But like when you, after you taught me, and after I started feeling comfortable and confident in my grooms. I dipped out because I didn't like that Sugar Hill. I didn't. I didn't like yeah. the yeah. the vibe. Yeah, it was yeah. shit. But you know. And I hurt. I hurt you. I know I did. It's like it. It was. It, it still. It still bothers me today that I did that. But mm-hmm. it's like, how do you? How did you? How, like, do you have like a maybe a formula or like a process that other groomers can follow where they can find and hide like the hiring process? Like, what do you do? So okay. Couple of things. One, first of all, I knew you were gonna leave eventually because that was the whole point of teaching me uh-huh. right i didn't teach you so that you could stay in the basement at sugar hill forever i didn't want to stay there right <laughs> yeah. so yeah so like and and uh nothing against sugar hill it's, they're great people i love those people i don't yeah. i certainly am not disparaging them. yeah you're still friends with a lot of them yeah oh yeah yeah but um but you know you, you want what you want to do is create a situation where when you have groomers that are going to leave that they have enough respect for you that when they leave they tell you and then you can then say okay super let me help you and that's what i tell them all if you want to go do your own thing Mm -hmm. go do your own thing do it let's do it i'll do it with you let's hold hands and skip down the fucking lane and i will help you so that you don't have to make all these mistakes that i made Mm -hmm. and so i take away that like you you don't have to sneak off Uh uh-huh right yeah um when you're hiring people I think attitude is more important than skill. So you're looking for attitude? 100%. Uh-huh. 100%. I need coachability. I need somebody who can take constructive criticism and re- recognize that it is constructive criticism. I'm not your mom screaming at you telling you you're not good enough, right? You're not attacking them. No, I'm saying this This is great. You've done a good job here. This right here, this needs work. Let me show you how to do it. Now do it this way. Uh-huh. Um, and we do that, we do a lot of that. And my, my lead groomer, Shannon, is she's a spectacular groomer. She's a really impressive groomer and she's growing as a coach, right? So uh-huh. right now, that's my job is to coach the coach, right? To yeah. help her become better at helping people feel better about what they're doing. Yeah. Um, she's so, she's really, really, really working Do you do so like, hard. when somebody is interested in working for you, do you um, do like a test groom? Yes. Like a lot of people, okay. We do a test groom and I, it's a working interview. I know a lot of places are like, oh, they, they get paid for that. I'm, I'll pay them for it if they push the issue, but no, it's an, it's an interview. Uh-huh. You're, you're showing me what you've got. Impress me. And uh-huh. what I'm looking for is handling skills. And I'm looking for what they think is an acceptable finished product. Uh-huh. Uh, like, and, and to see if, if they handle the dog with respect and kindness, that's, that's awesome. Right. Okay. I want to make sure that they know how to do a good bath. Cause if they don't know how to do a good bath, they probably don't know how to do a good groom. Like yeah. that's, I mean, really let's, let's be honest, right? Yeah. You gotta be a that's the basic. kick-ass bather to be a good groomer. Yeah. You gotta be able to do it. Um, that's the foundation. I, I used to look to see if they knew how to fluff dry, but nobody does fluff drying anymore. But, and honestly, like I can teach them that. That's not a problem. Yeah. We used to look at their finished groom and be like, 
you know, okay, yes, we want this groomer. But mm-hmm. I'm, I'm less worried about your speed. I'm less worried about your finished product. I'm more worried about your handling and your attitude. Um, the other thing is I talk to them about their expectations. Like, okay, so you, I watched you groom this dog. It took you an hour and 40 minutes to groom this sheet suit. What is your expectation with this level of, of grooming that you're doing? How much money do you expect to make doing what you're doing, mm-hmm. right? Because a lot of groomers get stuck on that, like, I, I'm not going to work for less than 50%. Yeah. Okay, well, 50% of what? Exactly. 50% of a $40 Shih Tzu groom is, is $20. <laughs> yeah. Right? 30% of a $100 Shih Tzu groom is $30. Uh-huh. So you won't work for less than 50%? Okay, well, 50% yeah. of what? Um, so if they, so we sit down and we have a conversation about like how much money do you need to make? Mm-hmm. And how many dogs do you realistically think you can groom? And is this a realistic number for you? Because you walked in the door and told me you can groom seven, but it's an eight hour shift and it took you an hour and 40 minutes. Yeah. So you can't groom seven. Yeah, the math doesn't... Let's be realistic, okay? Yeah. And, and, uh, and, but what I will do is say, okay, well, if you want to start out doing four, you can start out doing four. It's a lower commission to mm-hmm. do four dogs. So well, you do pay commission? We do pay commission. We used to pay hourly. Uh-huh. And then we tried to do a combination of hourly and commission. And honestly, the reason that I pay commission now is because it is so hard for groomers as an, because as an industry, we've got this commission mindset. Yeah. And it is so hard for them to make the shift from commission to hourly, it has just gotten to the point where I was tired of having that freaking discussion. Yeah. Um, I am willing to have the discussion about um, 50% of what, because I can couch that in with how much money do you want at the end of the week? And they'll say, you know, I want, I want to make $1,200 at the end of the week. Okay. Well, if you can groom this many dogs for this many days, you can make $1,200 at the end of the week at this rate of commission. You know, yes, we because we, we pay 40% um, for our senior groomers that can do a, a full book of dogs. Yeah, they get 40%, but 40% of a higher price. Of a higher making, price. Yeah, you're making more money. Yeah, and we provide a bather. We provide receptionists. We provide all the freaking equipment that they could possibly want. Most of our groomers have their own equipment. Like, she has, this is all of her own stuff. But yeah. if she walked in tomorrow and said, I, oh, my car was broken into and all of my shirts were stolen and everything is gone okay we got you here's all the equipment here's all the stuff we've got it uh-huh. we we do pay for if they use their own equipment we pay for the equipment maintenance you know wow. so um we offer uh health insurance we do a lot of things that a lot of groom shops don't do mm-hmm. one of you know there are a lot of other perks to working here besides commission also our groomers make money yeah you know what i mean so it's like uh we, we want to find a happy balance but you're giving your groomers a reason to stay. Yeah, it's got to be a good work environment, you know? I don't care if you're making six grand a week. If you hate going there, if you hate getting out of bed every morning, and you hate the people that you work with, and you think your boss is a fucking asshole... It's not worth it. It's not worth it. It doesn't yeah. matter how much money you make if you're fucking miserable. Yeah, you'll get ulcers. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. You'll have stress headaches. You'll get a wrinkle right here. In the middle <laughs> of your uh, yeah. But yeah, so like, so we we really like think that work life balance is super important. I talk to them about it and um, make sure that they know what they're getting into. Um, and then we also I touch I have touch ins like when we first when I first bring somebody in. At the end of the day, for their first couple of weeks, every freaking day, I ask them, how was it today? Did you enjoy your day? Uh-huh. Was it okay? Yeah. Um, and, uh, and then thereafter, you know, we touch in once a week. And then we have a three-month review. Uh-huh. And if... Um, oh, that's so important. Uh-huh. When I was hiring groomers... Um, I, I made the mistake of not doing that. I, I, I would have a prob- I would have uh, feel uncomfortable having those conversations and so I would avoid it. And what I noticed was that the first week maybe, not even the first week, maybe the first few days they have great attitude. But then they start coming in late, they start having an attitude, they start because I'm being so nice and I'm not yeah, I'm not the coach. I'm not I'm not I'm their I'm their coworker kind of. And yeah, like oh man, that's so important. You have to Constant. So, how long do, do you do that for? Like, when you have a new groomer, how long do you touch base with them, like every day? No, I do like daily check-ins for the. Oh, 
okay, so I, I do daily check-ins for like the first week and then um, a couple of days a week and then once a week, you know, and it kind of okay. it, it kind of drops off as they as they get more comfortable. One of the reasons I do it is because I want them to know that they can come and check in with me. You know, I want them to know that it's it's okay to to just come and tell me like, hey, I'm I'm this was a shit day. I didn't like it. Or uh -huh. yeah, woo. Yeah. Um, we also have a team communication chat like at the end of the day where everybody that works posts like this is what I did today. It was pretty good. This dog sucked. This dog didn't. This dog bites. This dog craps on the floor. You know, so like you know um, what your team was doing on a day that you were off. Right. Mm. So if you if say you're off Monday and Tuesday, you come to work on Wednesday, other people were working Monday and Tuesday. Well, what the hell happened? I don't even know about that. Yeah. What? Oh my God. Why is Chaco's dad here and so mad? What's going on? There's no communication. And, yeah. So, so this way we know, um, it works great because we also have a kennel team and we also have, you know, so they know like this dog didn't poop on the last walk. So be prepared. It's going to have doo-doo in its kennel when you come in <laughs> the morning, you know, yeah. like, like, you know, so that kind of thing. And it, it, it's a good way just to make sure that, and if you see that somebody is not doing their daily report and checking in on a daily basis, that's a, that's a warning sign, right? That person is, is not engaged with the team. Mm -hmm. Why are you not engaged with the team? Yeah, um, because we do have a team workshop, and I know there's a lot of shops that do a lot of competition. Um, you know, trying to that's my dog, that's my dog. You know, those kind of things. But we don't do it that way because I don't thrive in that environment because I am super hyper competitive and I turn into an asshole, mm. right? Because yeah, I'm so if the competitive. Goal is to win. I will fucking win yeah. at all costs, and, and the main cost is my dignity and. My, my peace of mind, and yeah. my niceness. So, um, so yeah, so we, we, we do work as a team. We help each other. Um, everybody will stop doing what they're doing to help another groomer if they need to. That is how we do it. It's yeah. none of this, I don't have time, I got too many dogs, I can't help you. Yeah, no. so you look forward to coming to work. Because yeah. you, you know the team's gonna support you. Yeah, and, and then I, I, and I've had to say to people, like, look, we are a team. If you are not a team player, you're not on our team, so go. Yeah, you know? that's so that's you're being very selective on who you allow to come in and play yeah. on your team. And that's a lesson that I've learned recently, um, and it was a hard lesson. Was that um, some people have issues? Everybody's got their problems, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody's got problems. Um, and sometimes when somebody has problems, you can talk to them about what's going on with them. You can coach them through it and they can be part of the team. Mm -hmm. But I'm not a fucking psychiatrist. <laughs> and yeah. I was trying to be a fucking psychiatrist. And there are some people that, that need psychiatric help, not me. Mm -hmm. not, I mean, I need psychiatric help, yes, but, but not, <laughs> not, they don't need the kind of help that I can provide. And when it is very clear that a person is not on the team, you need to cut that cancer out. Fast, right? Fast. Because it's going to affect the rest of the team. Yeah, and it does affect the rest of the team. And I lost a really, really, really good groomer who had a really good attitude because I didn't check the groomer that wasn't that good and did a shit attitude. Oh. Uh, yeah. And it was, it was a hard lesson to learn, you know. And, and Taya, wherever you're at, you know, like, come on. <laughs> I'm sorry, I fixed it. I, uh. I think it was... I forget, maybe it was Zig Ziglar, oh man, but they were saying, hire slow, fire fast. Yeah, it's Ritz Carlton. Uh-huh. Yeah, that's the Ritz Carlton hiring policy. And we do do, I do at least three interviews. Before you hire them? Well, th not three interviews, three trips to the shop. Um, they can submit an online application. They can send me their resume and their pictures in their portfolio and stuff, great. You have to physically come to the shop and fill out an application. Mm, you you want to see them in person? Okay. I want to see that they're willing to drive here. Because if you're not willing to drive here to fill out an application, are you willing to drive here to come to fucking work? <laughs> yeah. Right? Like, oh my God. How, how, I've, I've set up uh, working interviews and they don't show up. I'm like, why did you bother? Why did you go through the trouble of setting up an interview date and not show up? Yeah. Like, okay. <laughs> so yeah, so we'll do that. I do, they come to the application. And then we set up an interview, and they come do the, the sit-down talking part interview. Okay. If I don't like them talking to them, I'm not setting up a working interview. I don't uh, give a shit how good of a groomer you are. If you suck as a human, I don't want you in here. Yeah. Right? You think you're better than everyone? Yeah. 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 So, um, so that's a change that we made. Um, I we, love that. Mm -hmm. I love that. You, so you, you, have a, you have to come in, fill out an application in person. 
then you set up a interview dates where they sit down and you do a talking interview. Yeah, and I ask them questions and I I act a little weird and I make notes and I you know I, I have my questions written down to make sure that I ask all the questions the same of every person. Can I have I a, ask what I have an interview template. Yeah, I'll send it is, to you. Is it okay? But it's basically like the first question is why do you want to work here? Why do you want to work at this grooming salon? Uh huh. Not why do you want to be a groomer? Not why do you want to groom? But why yeah. do you want to work here? Like, what do you want from me? Yeah. And, and they, they should want something from you. Otherwise, don't bother me. Like, what is it you want from me? And they should have an answer for that. Right. I want to know wh why they're applying at this grooming salon. Is it just because they applied at 40 grooming salons and they're hoping to get the yeah. best money? Or is it because they went online and they read our reviews and they looked at our website and they were like, oh my God, these people are funny. I want to go be with them, right? Mm -hmm. And they look at the pictures on our on our Instagram and be like, I love the grooming that they do and I want to be a part of that. What What is it that made you want to come and apply uh-huh right yeah you know? did you even research our business at all yeah you would, it, it surprises me the number of people that will go and apply for a job somewhere knowing nothing about it yeah like, they're doing know. themselves a disservice because yeah. they might get hired on and they're gonna hate the place right <laughs> yeah. and then yeah. that's the other thing we do we do a trial period um it's we do for for a lot of positions we'll do a, a trial week uh, you try it out for a week. If you hate it, no harm, no foul. We'll pay you cash. Bye. Thank you for contracting. Uh -huh. um, if uh, if you love it, join our team. Um, that gives us and them an opportunity to see what it really is like to work here. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that I do is it's ninety days, and if if after if after thirty days you're you're really not getting it and uh -huh. not doing the things that we do, we'll give you some coaching and we'll talk about it and we'll say like, are you happy here? Do you like working here? Do you want to continue working here? If you do, these are the things that we need to improve mm. so that you can stay on this team so that we can be happy together. Yeah. Um, and after 90 days or at 90 days, I try to do it before 90 days because I don't know why 90 days is like the <laughs> cut off yeah. in my mind, but um, <laughs> uh, it's, it's time to go. If, you, if you're not on the team, yeah, let's, let's go find a team you can be on, right? Or just go work by yourself alone. <laughs> you know, that's yeah. fine too, I don't care. But, yeah, it but, might sound mean, but you're actually doing them a favor. Yeah, why do you want to work somewhere you hate? Yeah. And there are so many people that are used to working in places that they hate, that they'll continue working in a place that they hate, yeah. because that's just what they think you hate your job, job is. right? Yeah. My mom used to come home from work every day and say, oh, my feet hurt, my boss is an asshole. You know, my dad would come home and get drunk and watch TV. I mean, not my dad, but whatever. Yeah. Like, yeah. because they hated the, the boss. And Yeah. Okay, if you hate me, that's okay. I am not for everybody. I have a very specific taste. I know, I'm a little fucking weird. If you don't like it here, don't work here. Mm -hmm. Let me help you go find somewhere you might like. Yeah. Right? Say, this isn't working out. And I'll say, okay, well, I'll tell you what. I know 17 other fucking grooming shops that are desperate for a good groomer. Yeah. Let's get you on with one of them. Yeah. Because your personality might be better suited to them. Mm -hmm. Right? Why yeah. would you stay here? Yeah. So so that, to me, is super important. And, and th still, usually the people who don't get that, they're not a good match anyway, and they'll they'll walk on up there. You know, like the, my great my great yeah. groomer walk out where he had to come and save my ass. No, you know? I mean I would, I don't think I don't consider it because you you did most of the grooming. But <laughs> I mean, and the thing is, I think that maybe sometimes without even knowing it, groomers are burned out. Yeah. A lot of us are. Yes. I went through it a couple yes. times already. I definitely and agree. I think that sometimes, so. Have you had a, a groomer that was, you know, working for you and you noticed that they were getting burned out? Yeah. What, what do you do? Well, I tried to save her uh, and that was a bad plan because it, it, she needed to go. Uh, and what I should have done was let her go. Uh, Either give her a leave of absence or just fire her. Did you feel like maybe it would have been a failure on your part if you didn't save her? That was, that was really what, yeah. I wanted, I wanted to fix the problem. Yeah. I wanted to make her help her, yeah. you know, and, and it really just wrecked everybody else's time. And that uh -huh. was shitty and I shouldn't have done that. There are a lot of times, and I think, I think she might've just been, she might've been burnt out when she came here. Yeah. And she made a job change to try and fix the burnout, uh -huh. which is one way that you can fix burnout. But I think she was too far past her burnout and she was struggling with some other personal stuff as well. But, um, um, 
I think if you start to see the burnout in the beginning, you can catch it and you can you can fix it and, uh -huh. and you can suggest, you know, let's do less dogs. Let's take time off. Let's you need to go on a freaking girls weekend by yourself and get your toes done and, and get away from barking dogs for a while um, uh -huh. or change jobs inside the facility you know like you're burnt as shit on grooming these dogs do you want to go do reception for a little while uh -huh. uh, do you want to go be a bather for a week yeah. see if you like that better whatever i'm i'm all about changing jobs inside the facility um the teamwork thing really really helps with the burnout it really does because if you feel like you can turn to the groomer next to you and be like I'm going to stab this doodle in its eye if I can <laughs> scissor this head for one more second while he's jerking and hitting yeah. with his feet. And please, can you take over? And they say, yeah, sure, I got you. This palm's going to bite you. We're going to trade. You know? like, yeah. like it, it, But it, it takes so much of the pressure off. And it really, really I think does that's what it is. The pressure. Every day we feel so much pressure. And it's so intense. The work is so intense. We have people waiting and calling, why is my dog not ready? It's like, because your dog is freaking juking and diving <laughs> yeah. like a fucking right? boxer. Your, your dog crapped on the table four times. I've had to give it three baths and yeah. uh, it's not ready. Yeah. 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 And so we feel so much pressure every day. And then we go home so tired. We don't take care of our bodies. We don't eat right. And all of this, I think, adds up, and yeah. then we we just get burned out, yeah. and we we break. Yeah, and th that eating right—that's a really good thing that you said. We do. Um, I do buy lunch for groomers, and sometimes I buy pizza, and sometimes I buy healthy food. We do try to encourage everybody to eat healthy. We have a, they have a water break system that they'll do, or they, everybody brings their big water bottle, and then yeah. they'll be like water break, and everybody has to stop and drink water because groomers don't drink water; they drink Monster. Yes. And Red Bull. Yes. And they get kidney infections. And then they don't know why their feet hurt. Your fucking feet hurt because you don't drink enough water. <laughs> yeah, um, we're dehydrated. Yeah. Yeah. And we don't even know it a lot of times. Yeah. yeah. So, so there, you know, there's like, so burnout, take care of your body, right? Because that's, that's the number one thing. You only have one body. If you don't take care of it, you're not going to be grooming for long. Yeah. How many groomers do you know that have had shoulder surgery? Right? Or carpal tunnel surgery. Yeah. Like, go, don't get, go get some massage in your chest and your freaking shoulders and, and that will help with your carpal tunnel symptoms. Uh -huh. You know, get, do your stretches. Everybody do your stretches every day. Like, that will help. Eat right. Exercise outside of the grooming salon. I mean, I know a lot of groomers that are physically just broken down. Yeah. And they say, I can't exercise because I'm so broken. Right. Well, okay. So, I'm, this is for you groomers who are 23 years old. And <laughs> think you're gonna do this forever, and you're gonna make all the money. Go for some walks and eat some healthy food, and go to bed early. Yeah. You know, like treat your body right, because like literally you only have one of them. Um, do do things for yourself that are away from grooming. Like have a hobby that is not grooming related at all. Yeah, I tell um, people all the time, getting into archery a few years ago yes. probably saved me. And you're fishing. I mean, you fit, no dogs. No barking dogs when you're fishing. Yeah. 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 I, do, I do the horses, you know. There's, yes. There's no no barking dogs at the horses. Yeah. And uh, it, it is really, like, you have to have something that is just for you. And I don't care if it's reading books. Like, I read books. That's, that's the thing that I do. Um, but whatever it is, separate from grooming. Um, don't only read books about grooming. Yeah. Don't only read books about how to be better groomer or dogs or whatever. You need to do something that is that is unrelated so that you can give yourself a mental break. Yes. And and then the other thing is you have to be able to say no. Um, yeah. We we see a lot of this in the in the online forums. It's like my boss said I had to groom this dog that was trying. The I had to groom this giant. Freaking King Corso that was gonna growling at me. Yeah. No, no, you don't. Yeah. No, you do not have to do it. Yeah. Be don't be afraid to say, I have to reschedule my clients today because I am sick. I am tired. I am hurt. I am. Men I'm having a mental breakdown. Whatever. Yes. It's okay. Yeah. Do it. Well, okay. Oh no, I'm gonna lose those clients. I'm gonna lose that money. Okay. You're gonna lose your fucking mind. You're gonna lose clients when you're in the mental institution yeah. because you, and you're gonna end up bitter and resentful. Right? You're gonna lose clients when you tell them all to fuck off. Yes, I did. Yeah, I know. Yeah. So, <laughs> so like instead, instead, before you get to that place, you say, "I need a day off," and and you reschedule dogs. And if those clients 
come back at you and say, how dare you reschedule my dog? You say, oh, okay, clearly I'm not the groomer for you. Uh-huh, yeah. You can find a different groomer. Yeah. Because there will, there are more dogs and they will come. Yeah, yeah. There are more dogs and they will come. I think once I realize that, that I can get rid of every single one of my clients, go down to zero, and within a few weeks, I'll be back to 20. Yeah. Uh, I, uh, that gave me a lot of confidence. Wait. Maybe too much. No, no. <laughs> I think it's, you're totally right. We, I remember firing my first client. And I know there's a lot of people that don't like the term firing, but it's, it's the common term, and it's the easiest thing. It's, it's, was she didn't like the prices. She didn't like the service. She didn't like anything that we did. She complained about everything. She was rude. She was unpleasant. And it was just like, finally, I just said, I don't, I don't think I'm the right groomer for you. Yeah. Because clearly you're not satisfied with my services. And she was angry and she was mad and she left. And the phone rang. And it was a new client uh. who was nice with a nice dog who liked my services, who didn't mind my prices, and who tipped. So... Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. You know, I'm afraid to raise prices because I'm going to lose clients. You will. You'll lose the cheapest 10%. Well, and I think a lot of times it's our ego. I know for me it was my ego. I loved having a, a full client and not taking any clients. I'm like, I'm, I'm, bu- I'm, too, I'm not taking any clients. I'm fully booked. Yeah. It, it was like an ego thing for me. I love saying it. But then once I actually got rid of a lot of the clients that were really stressing me out, and I was scared to do it because that's a loss of income. And but then I realized these clients that were on my waiting list, that were waiting to get on my client calendar, they paid me so much more. Yeah. And they were so much nicer. I was like, yeah. I would because of a sense of loyalty, I guess, because I've been grooming these their dogs for years. Clients I felt are like friends. Yeah. My friends. <laughs> yes. I felt like they were my friends, and I owed it to these dogs because I, I groomed their dogs for the past few years. I, I got to keep grooming them. I love these dogs, yeah. Yeah, but by getting rid of them, it made room for better clients to come in. Yeah. My, the, my mentor, the groomer that, that taught me, well, I had several mentors, but, but Tammy White uh, was a, just a phenomenal groomer. She was a Bouvier breeder, and she was just all around a really freaking cool lady, and she was my friend. Um, and she taught me how to groom, but she thought that her clients were her friends. And she thought that by doing them favors, they would do her favors. And Tammy got very sick and she had to have a liver transplant. And mm-hmm. then the liver transplant failed and, and she was sick. And you know, I was a baby groomer. I didn't know what I was doing. I had no idea. I'm like in this shop. And in my mind, I'm like, if I don't groom these dogs, Tammy's not going to get her medicine. and She's going to die. Uh-huh. So it's on me. Right? So yeah. I'm, I'm faking it. I'm grooming these dogs. And these clients were up there bitching about prices. These clients were up there saying, well, where's Tammy? She's not gonna groom my dog. Well, fine, I'll just go somewhere else. Oh my God. And I'm like, well, wait, so you'll go to a different groomer that you don't know and get them to groom your dog rather than staying at the shop that's owned by the groomer that you do know that you're so loyal to that you only want her to groom your dog and and let her student or, or her employee groom your dog. Yeah. That doesn't make any sense. Well, that's, that's so disloyal, it's disgusting. Yeah. So, why has she been giving you this $5 discount yeah. all these years? Clients are not your friends. When I left Sugar Hill, you know, I had clients that said, I'll never let anybody but you groom my dog ever. Well, it actually, it takes like 10 minutes longer to get to where you are now. So I'm going to let somebody who's not you groom my dog yeah. for a 10 minute drive. And then people that I'd never expected, never expected to follow. They followed. I'm still grooming that crazy little teeny, <laughs> tiny Yorkie with the giant balls. Uh-huh. They, you know, the dad always, he always tipped $5 no matter what the price was and, and never was complimentary about the haircut. And the dog runs in circles on the table and uh-huh. they followed us. Yeah. Okay. I realized like Weird. my clients, I don't need them to like me. I just need them to pay me. Yeah. <laughs> well, pay me and be res- treat me with respect. Yes. Treat me with the same respect that I treat you with. And I think that's the biggest thing is like, we, one of the things that we pride ourselves on at Swanky Paws is customer service, right? We do really good customer service. Do you we, train? We have really good customers. Uh. It's really easy to give good customer service when you have a really good clientele. Mm-hmm. Our clients are awesome people. Like, they, like, bar none, we have the best clients. We really do. But one of the reasons we have the best clients is because we do good customer service. And when we don't do good customer service, it's usually because you're not a very good customer. 
Yeah. Uh, you know, like, and, and anybody who's interested in knowing what kind of business Swanky Paws is, I will 100% say go read our reviews, uh-huh. read some of our, our top 10 good reviews, and then go read all of our one star reviews. Because that is like really where it comes to bear is like what, what happens when the client is shitty. Yeah. And the, the answer is you got to go, man. Yeah. You can't stay here. Yeah. Go to somebody else's grooming salon where they like shitty clients because it's not me. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, I... and you have to be okay to lose business. You have to not be afraid of losing that business. You know what? Yeah. It's, it happened. The other day we got 10 one-star reviews back to back to back. Thank goodness Google has an algorithm and they know about uh-huh. when people do that, that it's bullshit. But, yeah. um, but you have to be okay with saying, I'm sorry, I'm not going to stand here and take this abuse from you. It's time for you to leave. Um, yeah. We have a no abuse policy. We have a hang up the phone policy oh. that is written in our policies. We do have an employee handbook. Back to you, you asked about that before. Yeah. And one of the policies is you are not required to take abuse from a client. And if a client is raising their voice at you on the phone or calling you names on the phone or being verbally abusive on the phone, hang up the phone. Huh. I love you that. You don't have to say fuck you and hang up the phone. Please don't. Yeah. Just hang up. <laughs> right? And then, yeah. and then what's going to happen is one of three things. One, they're never going to call back because they're angry. And okay, fine. Because you were yelling at us and calling us names. So don't call back. <laughs> two, two, they'll, they'll call back and yell at you more. Uh-huh. Right? Well, okay, same answer. Hang up. Or three, they'll be like, oh my God, I was yelling at that person and calling them names. What the fuck? Oh, I can't believe I was doing that. And then they'll call back and they'll say, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. Or you'll say, oh, oh, yes, no. we must have just gotten disconnected. Now, how can I help you? Yeah. <laughs> right? And you you allow them the grace to correct their behavior. Right? So, yeah. so that's your, those are your three choices. Allow you, them to save face. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, give it to them. It's okay. It's okay. We all fuck up. Everybody fucks up. It's okay. You're that. allowed to be an asshole once, right? You're yeah. not allowed to continue to be an asshole over and over again because nobody deserves to be abused like that. And if you feel like you're the person that goes into a fast food restaurant and talks to somebody like they're shit because they put mayonnaise and tomatoes on your BK griller <laughs> that you didn't want mayonnaise and tomatoes on, then you need to probably check yourself because you're not a very good customer yeah. and you're not going to get very good customer service. Like, yeah. and you're not the kind of customer that we're looking for. So it, may, it sounds like what you're, like, you're not only selective of the groomers that you hire, but you're selective of the clients that you take. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And we'll, we'll welcome anyone to come here and try us out. Like, we'll, we'll do it. But if you're standing in the lobby crying before you even let your dog go, saying, I'm, I don't trust leaving her at groomers. Okay, well then don't leave her here. Yeah. Right? Because if you know that you don't trust us, we don't actually want your dog here. Mm-hmm. Right? Because that's we're, we're waiting for an issue. If you're crying in the lobby because we're going to shave your doodle with a yeah. seven, then you need to go find somebody else. I think this goes right back to having a solid um, guideline. Not business plan, but a solid guideline. Who and, are we? Yes. yes. Who, am I, who am I willing to do business with? And um, I remember my mentor told me that having a good business plan, having a, have the guidelines and something, yeah. it gives you a lens mm-hmm. to hold up, to view through. And you can hold up this client and say, Is, does this person fit my lens? And if they don't, they got to go. People like us doing things the way we do them. Yeah. Yes. These clients are not doing things the way we do them. When they act like that, these are not the clients that we want to do business with. And, and because literally that person, that one person who is crying about their doodle, they're, they're going to be so much more of a headache, mm-hmm. right? We have clients that we have said, I've got, I've got one coming in two weeks. She has never cut her dog's hair, ever. It's a doodle. Uh-huh. It's in full coat. Uh-huh. And now it's 11 months old. Uh-huh. And it's matted from its chin all the way, all the way down to its butt. Yeah. But the side hairs are long and beautiful. Mm-hmm. And we said, I'm, I'm sorry. She's, she's got to have a haircut next time. She yeah. has to, and we're probably going to have to shave it. And she said, you know what? Whatever you think is best. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But you know what? When, when Nine years ago, when she first brought, brought us her Bichon that had been kicked out of all the other grooming salons because mm-hmm. he was annoying because he barked nonstop and bit for his nails and all the shit and drooled everywhere. And we said, okay, if you do these things, we will continue to groom this dog. And she said, yeah, I'll do them. And she did them, and she did every single thing we asked and suggested, every time we asked and suggested it, and now nine fucking years later, we are shaving her doodle's chest, and she's okay with it, she because she you. knows 
that if she does the things that we ask her to do, she will get the results that she wants to get because we do good customer service. We yeah. do good grooms and we do take care of the dog. When also you're treating it like she's part of the team. Yeah. Yeah, this we is teamwork. We respect her enough to tell her, this like we're not gonna mean. lie and say your dog was good. Why would we do that? Yeah. Because then she's gonna, she's gonna take that dog to the next groomer who's gonna say, he bit me. Yeah. And they're gonna say, oh, well nobody ever told me he was bad before. Yeah. Okay, well some clients might be lying, but I do also know groomers that, that won't say. And, and you know, my Danny that was here, we, we had a conversation about this. We have to tell the client, you know, he, he was really good for this and this, but he was very naughty for this, and, and we've got to work on it. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's why we do that, that grooming training program where people bring the dogs to work with the trainer and the groomer. Yeah. You know, like, like this dog needs to be trained. Yeah. Not just forced through the fucking groom. We're just going to get through it. I used to be that groomer. We're just going to get through it. We'll yeah. get through it to the other side, and then it'll be fine. But Just get it done. At but, what cost? Right, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so let's get it done, but let's get it done to a place where the client's happy, the dog's happy, and the groomer's happy. I love that grooming train. I never even heard that before. This is, today was well, the first time. You made it up. I love that. <laughs> I love that, the concept of a grooming train. Could you explain that for my audience? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if a dog comes to us, and we do get a lot of dogs referred from, especially the, the smarts, the big boxes where they can't muzzle. They'll send them to us because they know that we'll do them. Um, and, uh, and we'll say, you know, this dog is, fearful he has anxiety he has communication issues you know he he only knows two words which is bark and bite and, <laughs> and he's got to learn more words right so yeah. so and then what we do is we set them up with a plan based on whatever the behavior is that the dog is exhibiting some dogs need to come see the trainer a couple of times before they even get on the grooming table so you have a trainer on staff right? yeah we do we do uh we have we have actually a, a, a training team and we have some amazing dog trainers here like, that is so incredible so and they come in and they work with you during the groom yeah they'll so normally what they'll do is they'll do some leash work prior to the group so they'll work with the dog on the leash before we even get on the grooming table I just to make that. set the mind like okay you are a dog you are on the floor on a leash we're not clutching you to our breast and stro oh poor baby well, yeah. you know you're a dog um and let's act right and then we'll kind of figure out like okay so what is it why is this dog in pain? Is this dog just frightened? Is this dog just a fucking asshole? And is, you need to just understand that yeah. you can't do that. We do a, we try to always do positive reinforcement first. You know, some dogs need a little correction. Mm -hmm. um, and if they need a little correction to keep them safe and to keep the groomer safe, then we'll go to a small And it's the dog trainer doing it, yeah. not the groomer. Yeah. I, so you're, you're actually, the, the team is not just the groomers. The yeah. team is your entire, the dog trainers oh. here, the, the kennel staff, the receptionist, they're all part of the team. Yeah. And that's why the groomer should not be responsible for training the dog because that's not their position. Yeah, groomers aren't dog trainers. If yeah. you wanna be a dog trainer, go be a dog trainer. If you have to train every fucking dog on your table, that is not what you're getting paid for. Exactly, it's like asking the quarterback to play defense or something. Yeah. it's. Not smart. Quarterbacks get smooshed, right? Yeah. They do not play defense. They're not good at it, yeah. right? That's We're asking we need, the kicker. We need linemen for that shit. Yeah. yeah. Asking the kicker to play quarterback. Yeah, you can't do it. Yeah. They're gonna suck. I love this idea. Like, so if somebody has a grooming shop and they have a staff of groomers, but they don't have a you know train a dog trainers on staff, what would you suggest they do? So two things: send them to us, and we'll send them back. Or there's got to be, you've got to have a good local trainer, right? There is a local trainer that works in your area. Reach out to them and say, hey, I've got a couple of dogs. They're really freaking naughty. I'd like to do this grooming training program. Can you? Can I get you to come in one day a week and just work with these dogs and we'll pay you for your time? Work with these dogs so that we can get through the grooming, mm -hmm. right? Like, why not? Yeah, and then I guess you would have to make sure the customer's okay with the price. Well, yeah, and that's the thing. We do, we charge for a full training session. Well, so, well, not a, it's not like a private session. We do it like a drop-off day training, which is a little bit less expensive because they're going to spend the whole day with us. Um, and I know that doesn't sound like it makes sense, but what it does is it allows us to work the dog into our schedule as we need to, so yeah. it's less expensive. And then we charge for the full cost of whatever grooming service they're getting. So... Um, and, and sometimes, for some clients, that means you don't even know what it's going to cost when you drop off. Because if we can get through a full groom, we'll do it and we'll charge you for a full groom. But we might just be able to do the nails. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, but you're going to pay for that training session and then also whatever grooming services. And we also recommend that you do two to three sessions 
a week for two to three weeks in a row. So it is a financial commitment from the client. Mm -hmm. um, but, but then you get a dog that you can take to any grooming shop and they'll behave. Yes. So yeah, they so can go. They can go back to the pet smart that kicked them out if that's what suits their budget and that's what's conveniently located for them and they love their pet smart groomer. Go yeah. back. That's fine. So if, if here in Georgia, especially if you have a dog that is naughty at the grooming shop and they have been kicked out, then they can come bring them here. You will do a tr grooming train session. Or, you know, I, I guess create a, uh, a plan we, yeah, for them. Yeah, we create a plan for them. We have packages. If they buy the package, it's less expensive because, well, we get all the money up front. And then that way, if they decide they're done and they're not going to do it anymore, well, okay. Mm -hmm. then that's okay. That's on you. You can go back and, and you know. And, yeah. and some people can say that's not, it's not in my budget. If it's really not in your budget and you really, really, really want your dog to be good for the groomer, Still come talk to me. We will figure something out for well, you. And, it, and we can give you home training tips. We can give you yeah. things to do at your house that can help get your dog through the grooming process. Well, if somebody is on a tight budget, they need to look at it as an investment. Yeah, They're yeah. investing this money up front yes. so they can take their dog back to Petco or yeah. PetSmart or wherever. Yeah. And dog training is 100% an investment. I, I, we, we really, it is an investment in the future of your dog. If you've got a dog that is 11 months old and is biting people, that dog is not going to stop biting people because you didn't do anything, mm -hmm. right? That dog is going to continue biting people. Yeah. Their behavior is either going to get better or it's going to get worse. It's not, and it's not going to get better because you didn't do anything. Yeah, I used to take pride in being able to do difficult dogs. I need to stop that and tell, tell the owners, this dog needs a professional dog trainer. I'm not a dog trainer. Well, it is, it is a point of pride that you can work with those dogs and you can manage those dogs and you can get those dogs through the grooming process comfortably. But I'm not safely. helping them because if anything happens to me and I can't groom the dog. Right, who's gonna groom it? They're screwed. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not actually helping them. I'm helping my own ego. Well, you're helping the, the owner solve their immediate problem, but you're not helping them in the long run, uh -huh, right? That's so, a good way to and, and if you if you think about it like like uh, my dog, I mean shit. Scout was 17 years old when she died. 17. Yeah, Angel too. I'm gonna have a dog for 17 years that bites people. Why? Yeah. That's not a good existence for the dog. For 17 years, I'm going to have to pay the vet to sedate my dog once a year to have it shaved off. Yeah. Because it can't get along at the groomers. Yeah. Or because it, for 17 years, my dog has to wear a muzzle because it's so reactive that I can't take it anywhere in public. I can't have friends over to my house. Jesus, just pay a trainer. <laughs> right? Yeah, it's an investment. Yeah. Yes, for a better future. Yeah, 100%. I saw, but oh my God. Um, so I, I'm gonna wrap this up now because I know that. You're good. I've got, I've got time. I told them seven. Was okay. My, was my my heart out. I'm gonna get to some of these questions because some of these questions were actually nice. Um, let's see here. Oh, people. Uh, I'm not gonna read the compliments. People are complimenting me. <laughs> okay. Uh. I, Rachel Burgert says, I just started my own last spring. I have been doing it 13 years now. I'm still all by myself. No employees. Good. Oh, and she <laughs> says, um, I'll take any advice. I love networking and being able to talk with others in the industry. So, yeah, if uh, Rachel, she says, mentorship is great always, no matter how old of a yes. you are. Yes, absolutely. There's always something to learn. Yeah. Yes. So, Rachel, um, if you are wanting to hire employees, the way my, my friend Barbara's doing it is she's um, having them, it's a three-step process, come in At and fill out application. At least three times come into the shop before we decide if we're going to hire. Because yeah. I was hiring people right off the, if I like them and I like the, their working interview, I like their groom, I would hire them right on and then we would have problems later. Yeah. But they're, you're, that, this way you're preventing that. Well, happening. I'm showing that at least that commitment that they, they do want the job, right? And then, um, and then the... You're also seeing if there's any potential... Um, they're not able to take criticism. They're not able to take feedback. They take it personally. Um, they get their feelings hurt. You're able to see that before you actually take yeah. hire them on into yeah. the team. Well, and then the other thing that we do that's super, super important, one, we have written policies and procedures. So um, for Rachel, like right now, the way that you do things, write it all down. You know, if this is how you do a bath, write it down. If this mm. is how you, this is the things you say when you call a client to give them a bad report, write it down. That's your policies and procedures, okay? It's easy, you just write down what you do every day. Yeah. If somebody asks you a question, write down the answer because that's gonna be in your handbook, right? Oh, I love that. Okay, um, but we also do a written offer and a written job description. When uh -huh. we, so when we send out, when we, when we 
want to hire somebody, I will email them a written offer. It says, this is your position, this is how much money you're going to get paid, this is when you're going to get paid, this is how you're going to get paid, this is what the shop's going to provide for you, this is what we expect for you to provide to mm. us. Here is the job description. If there's any portion of this job description that you don't like or don't understand, we need to know about it now. Yeah. Right? Here's our employee handbook. Or will we send out a mini handbook, which just kind of like gets our, kind of our, um, our shop voice and, and kind of like our, the way our team does things. Uh -huh. Um, and, and like, so if you, if you read that and you feel like you don't, you don't jive with that, don't accept the job. Yeah. You know, like, like seriously. And we also say, please think about it. Please take at least 24 hours and think about whether or not you want to join our team because this is a commitment. And we, we want you to not. I love make that personally for likely. me, the fact that like I mentioned, you had a plan for me when I first started, you were like, this is what we're going to do. It made me feel safe. It made me feel confident in taking the job. Good. Yeah. Good. Like, yeah. Okay. So that was Rachel. Um, let's see here. Lin Linnell says, so excited for the stream. Thank you. She wants to thank you, Barbara. You are welcome. <laughs> um, let's see here. Uh, I saw a question about, um, I want to find it again. Let's see here. Mentorship is always great. She was asking about um, dog sports, if that's... Okay, so Rachel. Um, oh, uh, Diami says, how do you deal with unreasonable clients? We covered that. <laughs> um, you just say you goodbye. Say bye. <laughs> uh, Rachel Berga says, does dog sports with my dogs count as a hobby outside of that? I, I mean, yeah, I think so. If you're not doing dog sports and networking, if you're not doing dog sports <laughs> and handing out your business card and trying to get other you're dog sport people to come and get your dog groomed, yeah. Yeah, if it's a completely separate thing, if you go there and you're wearing, you know, you're not wearing your grooming smock or your, your team <laughs> sweatshirt, you yeah. know, or whatever, um, if, if you feel like your brain and your body can separate from grooming while you're doing dog sports, then I would say, yeah, it counts. The idea if is you, unplugging. Yeah, yeah, you've got to be separated from this this table, right? This this chain to the table that we have. That's yeah. that's how you're gonna prevent that burnout. And that's that's what your horses do for you. Yeah. When you're riding horses, you're in the moment. You're focused on that. You're not thinking about yeah. the dogs. We used to have a bather that she went. She did um, fast cat and she did um, uh, hiking with her dogs. And that for her, that was that was her separation. You know, uh -huh. because the dogs are her life. But yeah. even if you even if you are competitive, even if you show, even if you do competitive grooming. You've got to have a hobby that is different. Yeah. Something else. That's yeah. Not related. I, I use the Dremel as an example. Like, we have to charge our Dremel. And I tell them, like, if you don't charge it fully and you keep using it, it's going to run out. And yeah. that's what we do. We yeah. never unplug or we never charge and re refresh our soul, I guess. Yeah. Recharge our soul. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. And we just come into the work next day. Yeah. Burnt out and tired. Oh, and sick? Why are we going to work sick? Yes. Why do people go to work sick? Yeah. What the fuck? That's a I... terrible. It's a. First of all, don't bring me your cooties. I don't want your germs. <laughs> yeah. Stay home because you're gonna make the whole damn shop sick. Yeah. Right? I guess but you we're feel trained. like I'm not a hard worker. You can't quit. We've got dogs booked. Okay. Well, we need to reschedule them. And that's on shop owners, right? Because we got to make money. We got to make money. We do have to pay the bills. Absolutely. Okay. Well, don't pay fifty percent commission because you're paying partner's wages to an employee. Yeah. Right. That makes and, sense. And let your employee be sick one day. And if you're a shop owner that is not a groomer and you don't know how to groom, you need to fucking learn how to groom. Yeah. You need to learn how to do some basic grooming because I yes, my business does run if I'm not here because my team is stellar yes. because I have an amazing team. Also, they know, like I just had my customer service supervisor called me earlier and was like, man, I am sick. I am really sick. I don't think I can come to work tomorrow. Mm -hmm. No worries. I got you. Mm -hmm. I will work your shift. You know how to work every position in here. Hell yeah, I do. Yeah. 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 And I will support you. Now, I am not a trainer, but, but when we, when we lost a trainer and we had training booked, I worked with the dogs. Mm -hmm. I did it. I do know how to do basic obedience, right? Yeah. I know how to do leash manners and that kind of stuff. If you're going to offer a service, you need to know how to do at least the, the bare bones basics of mm -hmm. it. You need to know how to do a bath. You need to know how to do nail trims and clean and pluck ears, those type of things. So that if you can't cancel or reschedule, you can say to those clients, look, I'm so sorry our groomer's sick. Today we're going to give Fluffy a good bath and brush out, and we're going to go ahead and reschedule you for two weeks at a discounted rate. Whatever. You know, you just yeah. make it happen. Yeah. But 
but yeah. Also, that's... if you don't know how to do it, how can you even tell whether or not you're looking at good work or not? You know, you, like you have to be able to tell this this groomer knows what they're doing, and if you don't even know what you're doing, how can you yeah. recognize? Yeah. Well, and that's the other thing. We got all of our um, kennel techs and receptionists are trained in how to do a groom check. Oh, one of our team things that we do is groom checks. It doesn't matter how long you've been. I get a groom check. If I do a haircut, I get another groomer to look check my work. Make just, sure I didn't miss toenails. Make sure I, there's no hair on their butthole, whatever. Check my work. Yes. Make sure the ears are even. I'm really bad about Yeah, um, me too. <laughs> um, and, uh, and so we also train our, our kennel team and our bathers and our receptionists how to do a groom check. Uh -huh. So that they can look at the dog and see, it does this dog look balanced? Are the toenails done? It, is it clean? Does it smell good? So that when we do send something out, it, yeah. it's right. Everybody in the shop knows how to, how to spot a good groom versus a terrible groom. So it's not like um, somebody's going through, like they're in a grooming competition and they're getting critiqued like that. It's more like, what is the owner gonna look and check for? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And also like, okay, if I know that, that Mary Sue always forgets to get the armpits cleaned, then I'm gonna say, She'll say, oh, can I get my groom check? And I'll say, I don't know, Mary Sue, did you check your armpits? <laughs> and then she'll look and she'll be like, oh, shit, I forgot armpits. But you know what it's going to do? It's going to help her be better yes. as a groomer, right? Yeah. And it's going to reduce the number of clients that call up here and say, oh, dog's armpits are all hairy and have bats in them. Okay, yeah. super. So we'll... we'll and I know we just me for myself, if I knew that somebody was going to check my groom afterwards, I'm going to be a little more focused. I'm going to make sure because I don't want to, somebody to say, hey, you missed the no toenails. But, but the other thing that's good about it is, is it takes, again, it takes the pressure off, right? Because if I know that somebody's going to check my work, if I miss something, well, it's okay because they're going to check and they're going to help me catch that and they're going to help me fix that. And if I don't know how to fix it, they're going to teach me how to fix mm -hmm. it. Because right? it's not a competitive environment here. Right. Yes. Right. I love that. Um, you know, there's a, there, I forget who said the quote, but nobody ends up at the top of the mountain by accident. <laughs> you have to have a plan. You have to be uh, dedicated and committed to getting up to the top. You know, you have to. Yeah. And if you're, if you're trying to get to the top by stepping on people, you're not going to reach very far because people eventually run out. You'll run out of people and there'll still be mountain left. Yeah. You might step on the wrong person. Yeah. There's not going to be any more people <laughs> letting you step on. Yeah. Because yeah. they're going to say, we've heard about you. Yeah. yeah. But if you get a team <laughs> together to go with you, they'll help you carry your shit. Ah, uh, yeah. Yes. Yep. Yeah. So Rachel, um, the one that asked about the dog sport, she's saying you have to care about your groomers more than clients. I once worked yes. for a lady who stuck up for every client, never stuck up for any of the groomers. It made me feel crappy sometimes. Yes, exactly. And okay, that's what, what you do. You're, what kind you're of protecting... zoom do you have? Can you can you guys see my? No, no, you're you're actually kind of far away. Okay, I can't well, see any. There's a scar <laughs> right here on my eyelid from where I got punched in the I just, face I just by a client. It. Yeah. It's... Oh my God! You got yeah. punched in the face. Yeah. So. My client. <laughs> don't take it that far. Stand up for your groomers. Yes. Don't take it that far. You do yes. not need to have groomer fight club. Um, uh -huh. like for real out in front of the freaking building. It was ridiculous. But yeah, no, we, we, uh, that is 100%. I have fired clients. I have fired clients for calling groomers names. I have yeah. fired clients. Oh, it, you, I'll tell you what, walk in my lobby and say one thing that sounds a little bit racist. You mm. will either be very embarrassed and backpedaling very quickly, or you will be out the fucking road. Bye. Yeah. Yeah. yeah we don't, that's not a thing that happens here. <laughs> um, you know, like the, the, the I've had, clients say that groomers were lying and my response is I've never known this groomer to lie before they've worked for me for a long time and I, I trust them um I've, I've asked clients well what would you like would you like me to fire this person so that they don't have a job anymore because they didn't do something that you wanted them to do or you don't like the way they did the thing well, yeah uh, uh, like what is your goal uh, uh, here uh, yeah you know and I'll yeah. ask them I'll are you trying them. to cut someone's livelihood what will make you happy in this situation would yeah. firing this groomer make you happy is yeah. that what would make you happy? Because if that's what would make you happy, well, fuck you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, like, I'm, I'm not going to do that, right? Now, obviously, if a groomer is does something that is gross negligence, if they are abusive to a dog, if they're abusive to a coworker or a client, well, they're out too, right? We, we just, there's no abusing here. We yeah. don't do that. Don't be shitty to people. I don't care if you're a client or a dog or a customer. We don't be shitty to each other. Yeah. We're going to teach you how to not be shitty. Yeah, One be supportive, yeah. encouraging. Yeah, or you're gonna go. Those are the two choices. Yeah, because it, it only, it only, and this is real. I mean, a bad apple will ruin the whole batch. Yes. Just one bad apple yes. will actually ruin the whole batch. Yes, and I get so fucking mad when people say, oh, well, those are just a few bad apples. Okay, yes, a few bad apples. Yeah. 
ruin the whole bunch. Exactly. So Somebody... when we hear about a groomer that's abusing a dog, you know, this groomer that choked this dog and this other groomer videoed it. Uh-huh. What the fuck are you doing videoing someone choking a dog? Stop them! Yeah. Stop them! Put your phone down and stop that from happening. What the fuck? Yeah. Why are you still working there? My boss is abusive to dogs. Why are you still working there? Mm-hmm. If you really, really, truly think it's abusive, stop them. Yeah. If you really, truly think that they're going to physically hurt you if you try to stop them, uh, leave. Yeah. You know, but but getting your phone out and videoing them, that that is some freaking clout chasing right there. I'm sorry. That's bullshit. Yeah. Don't, don't do that. And, and I've had groomers say that I was abusive. And I've had days in my past where I've been... Over the top with a dog. I've done shit I probably shouldn't have done. Well, we, to get the groom done. Yeah. You gotta get it done. Because we're under so much pressure and I so much stress. I was wrong. That was wrong. And I've done, I've done, done wrong done things too. I've done things that I'm so ashamed of because I got upset. Because I hit my limit. And yeah. I, I didn't have a support system. I was system. burnt out. I had no one backing me up. Yeah. I'm yeah. With you. That's why we don't do it that way here. Yeah. And that's your brand, right? I mean, this is your... So I think a lot of people, um, when we think of brand, we think of like, uh, we have to have a catchy catchphrase or a catchy motto or something. That's not it. It's, um, it's the feeling you get. Like, uh, I think it was, uh, I think it was Seth Godin. He was saying, you'll, you'll rarely see anybody with a Suzuki tattoo. Right. <laughs> Harley Davidson says something about you, yeah. but you know, Kawasaki or something, they're not gonna put that on their arm. Like a brand, what would you, how would you define what a brand is? That's kind of like knowing who you are and who you want to serve, right? Yes, yes, absolutely. So your brand is different from your branding is different from your marketing, right? Okay, so, I so, love how you, I yeah. love how you're defining this. Our brand is like, okay, so we have a mission statement um, and it's, uh, our mission statement is to provide superior grooming and excellent products in an upscale environment. I think that's it. I, <laughs> I, 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 I quiz my groomers on it every single month at our um, at our, our monthly meeting. We have a monthly meeting and I quiz everybody and I, they, they get a prize if they get it right. Nobody ever gets it right. <laughs> but here I am, I don't know it. But we also have um, we also have our core values. We have core values. Our core values are always be kind. Our, our core values are, are always overcome and adapt. Our core values are get it done. Mm -hmm. Our core values are, you know, that, that you are important, value yourself. Like we have a list, a printed list of core values. That's that our says brand. who you are. That's our brand, right? Uh -huh. And then we have our branding, right? We're yeah, what fabulous. Is branding? Bra branding is this really cute logo and this awesome freaking font that we paid for because we didn't steal anyone's art. We paid <laughs> for it. Uh -huh. um, you know, like, and, um, so our, branding is how you present who you are. Right. So like our, our shirts that say, get swanky on the back and, and our black and pink and our business cards and all of these things that look professional. And I didn't just draw something myself and, mm -hmm. you know, and, and we get everything spell checked and we get things checked for grammar and we don't use apostrophes where they're not supposed to be because we are professional. Yeah. You don't see PetSmart using the wrong your on a poster, right? Yes. So <laughs> PetSmart, you may not want to be like them, but they make a lot of money. And if you want to make a lot of money, do the things that the people with a lot of money do. Yeah, research right? what they did. Yeah, so, so branding is important. It should look slick. It should look professional. Even if you your whole shtick is mom and pop, Right? That's fine to be a mom and pop shop. But be a mom and pop shop that's professional. Uh -huh. Be a shop. Yeah. Right? Like don't just be mom and pop. Um, yeah. And uh, and then and then your marketing is how you present your brand and your branding to the general public. Right? So we do most of our marketing is on social media. We do some print ads in like some neighborhood magazines that support charities because we feel like that's a that's a worthy that shows you care well it shows we care but also it's decent and, and we don't do print ads we've done like those monthly mailers and you know the penny pincher and that kind of stuff first of all you don't get a return and second of all who is that benefiting yeah who's that good for yeah no at least with the freaking women's club charity magazine it's it's going to help kids learn how to read or something like that yeah that way i know that the money that we're spending even if i'm not getting a good return on my investment for a print ad at least it's an investment in something decent yeah. right instead of just some scummy freaking 
guy that's, I don't know, whatever. One thing I remember that you told me when I, um, 12 years ago when we were working together is you do good things for the to, to do it you don't do it to try to get something back yeah then because it's no longer good yeah 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 you I, do, just do the good thing because it's the right thing to do not, yes not i remember that's what you said that I, I, I changed the word to good but it was right you said you do the right thing because it's the right thing you don't do the right thing because you're trying to get something out of it yeah. and it's, you might get something me. out of it but you might not uh, more often okay. than not Right, we, we bite the hand that feeds, and more often than not, I have no good deed goes unpunished. I mean, we have all these sayings because doing the right thing sometimes doesn't work out for me. Yeah, but it's still the thing that we're supposed to do. Exactly. It, I I it, I remember it to this day, even though it's twelve years ago, because the story that you told me before that you helped somebody and you went out of your way, you really did, and basically they fucked you. Yeah. And. <laughs> You were saying that it's okay though, yeah. and you were saying that you had to meditate because it did upset you. You meditated and you let it go. You released it, and you you told yourself, "I did the right thing because it was the right thing." Yep. And I was like, "That is amazing," and it stuck with me. And I actually applied that to my life. And I, I now like whenever I have the opportunity to do the right thing, I always choose to do the right thing because, or what I believe is the right thing. Yeah. Because it, that stuck with me, that conversation stuck with me for 12 years, and I, it still applies to me. But Good. you do the right thing because it's the right thing. I, I didn't come up with that. I didn't make that up. I, I, don't, I don't need credit for that. <laughs> because, like that. Somebody had to tell me that shit because I didn't always do the right thing just because it was the right thing to do. Sometimes I did the easy thing because it was the easy thing, or sometimes mm. I did the thing that I thought would get me the most credit, money, whatever it was that I wanted. You know, like, so... And it's a hard lesson to learn. And you don't learn it in one day. You don't do the right thing automatically every time. You still do the wrong thing a lot of times. 